<clears throat> okay, hello. Um, today we'll talk about uh, two uh, North American architects. We'll start with uh, Walter Netsch, an interesting architect uh, who worked for SOM, uh, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, a very important uh, and large uh, architectural firm in the United States. Uh, he became a partner there, and uh, but he built some very almost personal buildings in a, in a company which cultivated quality, and it does continues to do so, but not necessarily a personal, almost idiosyncratic architecture. But Walter Netsch was a, a very personal architect within this very large. Uh, uh, firm, a uh, phenomenon, uh, SOM. So Walter Netsch, born on uh, February 23rd, and he died on June 15th, and that's the reason we talk about him today. He died uh, 15 years ago on June 15th, was an American architect based in Chicago. He was most closely associated with the brutalist style of architecture as well as with the firm of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, in short, SOM. His signature aesthetic is known as field theory and is based on rotating squares into complex shapes. He may be best known for as the lead designer for the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and its famous Cadet Chapel. The cadet area of the academy was named a National Historic Landmark in 2004. He was a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. This was the man. And um, he died at 88. Uh, an interesting architect. Here he is with another important uh, architect in the same uh, firm, um, SOM, on the left but uh, Gordon Bunshaft, but the one on the right, uh, you know, he does look a little bit strange with that uh, Alpine uh, sweater on him. <laughs> I imagine he was a very, a very special man, maybe, maybe a little difficult, but uh, that's how geniuses are, it is said. I don't know if he was a genius, but he was, he was uh, an, an interesting architect. Uh, and I think his sweater kind of testifies to it. I mean, you know, the other man is with a, in, in a suit. Yes, with a little bit of a sweater underneath the coat. But look at uh, Walter Netsch, you know, not only he has a winter coat in his uh, hands, but also this, uh, you know, skiing uh, uh, sweater, Alpine sweater on him. Well, here he looks more like a partner at, of a SOM. Uh, not SOS, but SOM. I actually wrote once a short um, article on SOM. I said SOS, but not SOS. SOS meaning danger. But the truth is they, they do build uh, occasionally some uh, almost adventurous buildings. <clears throat> Here he is in his older age, in his uh, house. Uh, itself uh, kind of a... Uh, architectural manifesto, uh, Walter Netsch. The strange thing is that I actually worked in the campus of Northwestern University in Evanston, uh, Chicago, or Evanston, Illinois, without knowing that actually that campus was designed by Walter Netsch. I found out about this when I was already back to Romania. And uh, now I'm beginning to show works by this, uh, this architect. I, I don't know if he was a brutalist architect, but brutalism, uh, strangely, uh, uh, generates emotion in us. Uh, and uh, you wonder, you know, how could something brutal uh, generate affection? Maybe the so-called uh, brutalism is, uh, <clears throat> is actually an expression of, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, 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 an expression of sincerity. And sometimes, uh, yes, truth is brutal. And, but it's preferable to have a brutal truth than a soothing lie. 
much better. He did work with the geometry in uh, unexpected ways, and you see here as well. Um, it's, 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 I think, I mean, I am not an expert in Walter Netsch, but I, I do have a, a, an increasing interest in this architect. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I wonder how come a, such a personal architect was able to work in a very, very, very large architectural firm. Usually people like him work uh, on their own, but he worked a little bit on his own too, but he achieved uh, success and he built uh, most significantly when he worked with uh, SOM, Skidmore, Owings and Mary, where he became a partner. Uh, this uh, manipulation of geometry, these rotations show a certain restlessness, but a quest also for um, uh, instability, but an instability which simultaneously was balanced by a sense of belonging and a sense of, uh, you know, solid uh, implementation, if I can, if I can say so. But this is very interesting because a uh, large corporation, because they were like a corporation, SOM, uh, still are. Um, you know, to to uh, admit, to accept, and even encourage such works is, is very unusual. I look at the, you know, the lab labyrinthine, uh, uh, almost chaotic, uh, uh, you know, uh, construction site. Uh, I read that uh, some people uh, are a little bit confused in his buildings because of this uh, sense of wandering of a, of a labyrinth and they get lost. But other people say, you know, I'm gladly getting lost in the buildings of Walter Netsch. You know, it's actually an organized ordered architecture, as you can see clearly here, and is even symmetrical. But because of these rotations, the instability that I mentioned uh, manifests itself, and uh, you know, some some people get a little bit uh, uneasy about it. Although I I think they they shouldn't. Look at the plan, perfectly symmetrical. He uses the octagon. Now I, I read that uh, very recently even uh, Bjarke Ingels employed the octagon for a uh, large uh, scale uh, site planning in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, so the octagon is coming back to, to life in architecture. And I think uh, that's a good thing because there is a, a lot of uh, symbolism associated with the octagon very important architects employ the octagon, like Leonardo da Vinci, although he didn't build, but he almost all his architectural sketches employ the octagon. And now we see Walter Netsch employing the octagon. There is also the symbolism of number eight. And if you are interested in this matter, uh, I posted on, on the YouTube, YouTube channel where I, I post uh, these uh, presentations, one about number eight, but others will follow, God willing, about number six or number five or number four. I mean, these are, you know, maybe all, all numbers are important, but some are more important than others. And I think uh, uh, maybe we should bring back to architecture uh, you know, some of the complexities that are associated with at least some numbers, you know, symbolism, even spirituality, mythology, mysticism. Are we using numbers in this way these days? I doubt it. I mean, the last time I mentioned numbers was when I talked about Carlos Carpa, that apparently uh, Carlos Carpa used number 11 all the time in his projects. And that's because there are 11 letters in his name, Carlos Carpa. If you add all the letters, I mean, you know, the number of the letters of he, both his names is 11. Well, maybe it's time to count the number of letters in your name and employ that number at least sometimes in, in, in some of your projects. Even if you don't tell it, you don't, uh, you don't uh, uh, 
tell anybody about this. Because I do think it's important to bring back some um, mystery to our projects, you know, some, um, uh, you know, something, uh, you know, less uh, pragmatic and less uh, obvious and less, um, you know, uh, mercantile. Yes, the mysticism of numbers, for example. The mysticism of oct the octagon. Here we have a we had and have a very modern architect, Walter Netsch, and look at his plan. It is it is an expression of who he was, but these rotations, in my opinion, create a dynamic architecture, and the, the level of instability is actually. Uh, uh, I would say uh, quality, uh, you know, a, a positive thing, not a negative one. Because, it, because the, if there is too much stability, you know, uh, death is closed. Life is unstable. Uh, here is his own house in Chicago, uh, in a you know a context uh, with some history to an extent let's not forget it's the brave new world but the house is um, is uh, agitating a little bit the serenity of the of the uh, you know of the historicism of the street and uh, uh, it does so because this is what uh, modernism is good at to unsettle things it's not a, a big deal, actually. You know, it's not extravagant. I could make, and maybe I will if I am in good shape, uh, after these two presentations, present Bart Prince, who was, an, a, who is a very, a very, uh, you know, spectacular architect, so to speak. But this house by Walter Netsch towards the outside is not... Uh, amazingly different. It is different if you look at the house on the left, but not dramatically. Inside though, the things are a little bit more complicated and we are going to see. Uh, look here, this is the interior of the house. After he died, it became a, a place for uh, research almost. Students in architecture, you know, come here and study and so on. There is a fluidity of the space and also certain um, ambiguities. As you, what's, what exactly is going there in front of the sofa? You know, the sofa is rather explicit. It is a sofa. The chair, it is a chair. But what is, what is this thing in front of the sofa? Is it a table? What is it? It is a table, but what, how, how exactly it is? It's a little bit unclear. So I guess uh, Walter Netsch uh, tried to bring into the known the unknown. And I think uh, the quest for the unknown is a, is a desirable one. So he was very good at, at, at operating with these diagonals, with these rhomboids, with these... Uh, either octagons, triangles, rotating them, rotated squares. And uh, he, he was fascinated by this. By the way of fasc being fascinated, do we remember a few days ago, we talked about um, fascination being the source of the quality of the work. And I will say again and again, please, dear students, make fascinating, fascinating works. Fascinating um, uh, projects of architecture. Nothing less. Just tell your professor, professor, I, 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 I want to do a fascinating uh, project. Even if you don't like it, professor, I'm sorry, I have to do a fascinating uh, project. So do it. Do it because in the absence of fascination, we, we fall in, in boredom and we don't want to be bored. Look at this. What, what exactly is going on here? It is a stair, but something doesn't seem to make sense here. It, it seems that as if illogic e came into the building in some form. And this, I love this, you know, to, to create through measurable means 
uh, manifestation of the illogical. So again, this is this was his own house, but not everything is extravagant or unsettling, you know. But there are still. Look at this angle here, you know. Uh, some professors would protest, would say, "Wait a minute, what's happening here?" Well, why, why, why does everything to why does everything have to happen logically or, uh, you know, uh, placidly or correctly? This is an invitation to irritation, even to, uh, you know, to something which is actually part of life, uh, very much so. Interesting house. Because towards the outside is not uh, really alarming. But inside you can tell his, uh, you can discover the restless spirit of Walter Netsch. He was a restless man. And we got uh, an indication in this sense, uh, contemplating his Alpine sweater. And here are the students in architecture and the professor or two, you know, a large house. Obviously, look at look at the height of the ceiling. Um, he was doing well, of course. Being a partner at SOM is not a little thing. Um, yeah. But again, this this surreal manipulation of geometry uh, is intriguing and unsettling. It's almost something a little bit devilish about it. Plenty of students now uh, finding room in his uh, uh, angularly um, fluid house. We need provocations, dear students. Please provoke us. Please make provocative projects. Don't be, don't, don't be, don't be, don't be, you know, uh, uh, tamed by the school, please. Be alive, be yourselves with all the risks. Unsettle the professors. I think Walter Netsch would smile at you if, if he would know that, that, that you think unconventionally, not conventionally. Make houses in such a way that one day when, unfortunately, maybe you'll not be any longer on this earth, the students in the future will visit your house or your houses the same way these students visit the house of Walter Netsch and look how they look. They look up. They look up with curiosity. Some take pictures. This is how architecture is beautiful, as an adventure. If it is not an adventure, forget it. Better do something else. Now, I know that if you if you try to climb these stairs with a, you know uh, with a piano, uh, you might encounter some difficulties. But you know this is not the you know the the test that uh, we should always employ. You know how do we bring the piano in the room as if we are all conductors or piano players or I don't know what. Now look at this children home in Nelsville, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, where Frank Lloyd Wright was born, and he even had his atelier uh, and uh, home, Ateliers and East. Uh, this is just the reflection, but this is the building. Uh, so again, it's a Winnebago children home. Not bad, not bad at all, because I think children like like unexpected things, like things that are, uh, you know, childishly, uh, you know, provocative. They like to play, no children. Oh, why shouldn't we as architects be playful as well? Why should we make a placid rectangular space, you know, that doesn't have anything dynamic about it, nothing provocative, nothing inspiring, that would bore the, the children. Let's make something that is, uh, you know, uh, unique and uh, challenging even. Uh, he, he employed the geometry, 
but he loved rotations in a devilish way. And, and uh, this created a dynamic architecture. Be playful, please, because if you are not playful, you cannot be truly creative. It's very important to be playful, courageous, to laugh, to smile, to have joy. When you do architectural projects, you have to be joyous. Now look here, it's almost a, a house upside down, no? What he created here. But is it not so typical of childhood to, you know, turn things around and, uh, you know, do, do unexpected things? I think so. And so Fujimoto has a great success with his um, unconventionalism. And by the way, of uh, Fujimoto, maybe you know, he designed and built in a very, very civilized Japan an outdoor um, toilet, what we call in Romania, uh, Olatrina. Yes, in Japan. And it's even a train passing by, not far away from it. While we have them in the in the country in Romania, in so many places, and everybody complains, ah, oh, we are not civilized. We have to, we have to have them inside the building. While in Japan, uh, a famous architect like Fujimoto built one recently outside in a garden. Anyway, the building, the building by Walter Netsch. Is, uh, is a building I wish I was uh, in when I was a child. Because you have to imagine a child who is, uh, uh, you know, confronted, so to speak, with such an interior. There is a chance that that child becomes open-minded uh, uh, later on in life because the space he is moving in is open, is not closed, is not a, a closed box. So there is a chance when mature, when adult, that child will, will uh, uh, make uh, Walter Gropio smile with his saying, uh, a mind is good if it is like an, um, works best uh, when it is like an umbrella, open. And look at the plan, sorry about the resolution. This is how I found it, but it's good. It's good, Walter Netsch. SOM, Skidmore, Rowings, and Mary. Here again, we see the, the, the drama of space. But space also implies time, you know, because in time, I mean, you know, if you move around within the building, you perceive the various uh, interesting things in terms of space. But there is a relation between space and time. I know we are obsessed by space, but maybe uh, Vito Acconci was correct when he said architecture is not about space, it's about time. This is another building, an interesting one. Uh, I don't know why I show this building here. Uh, anyway, other pictures from that uh, home for children. And I love this picture. I really love this picture because I love the use. You know, you can tell that they are troublemakers. I mean, absolutely. They are all troublemakers, you know? <laughs> and I think they became even more troublemakers encouraged by the building by Walter Netsch. Be like them, dear student, just like them. You can tell they are ready to do something mischievous. <laughs> I love them. That's how, that's how the youth is supposed to be, mischievous, to do interesting things, almost illegal things, crazy things, but they are life, no? They are the spring of uh, humanity. These children. Library at Wells College, Walter Netsch again. Again, look at the interior, look at the roof. Why should we have, you know, flat, roofs. Why? What's so enlightening about flat roofs? I would rather have such a roof, you know, turbulent. Yes, a turbulent roof. Make turbulent um, uh, roofs, please. Because they represent that uh, tension, that uh, 
agitation uh, moving towards the sky. Look what's going on here. Walter Netsch, why did he do these things? He could have done uh, a simple, uh, you know, column or whatever. Why did he complicate himself? Why did he complicate himself here? Because there is joy in that complication and there is discovery and there is a sense of drama and the sense of sculpturalness and the, uh, the sense of art and the sense of movement and the sense of creation. Look at the plan here in, uh, on the left. Truly, uh, the more I, I look at his work, the more I appreciate this architect, Walter Netsch. I almost regret I didn't apply to work for SOM myself. After all, I lived for five years in Chicago. It was a mistake. At that time, I didn't know that such architecture was possible in that office, although I knew about them. Now, I'll show probably his most famous work. It's this uh, cadet chapel at uh, the US uh, Air Force Academy, uh, which was initially, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, controversial, but uh, in time it became a very famous building and uh, you know, everybody is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is now very appreciative of this building. So let's read a little bit about it. In 1954, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill were commissioned to design the United States Air Force Academy Cadet Chapel. So as in 1954, no, that is uh, almost 70 years ago, located in El Paso County, Colorado, just outside of Colorado Springs, the chapel is of the training center for officers of the United States Air Force, which is a large self-contained community. At an elevation of 6,500 feet, so that's about uh, a little more than 2,000 uh, meters, on the east coast, on the east, uh, Sorry, I don't know. There is a telephone here. I don't, I don't understand why nobody is calling me, and now somebody is calling me. Yeah. And I don't know how to turn off the the maddening uh, <laughs> the maddening telephone. Please bear with me. I hope okay. It finally stopped. It infuriates me the mobile phone. So let's continue to read. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, the 3,000 acre academy also contains housing for 8,000 people, a supply center, a hospital, an airfield, and an academic complex rising up the slope of the site. This program is split on three levels due to the slope with the administration building, the social center, and the cadet chapel on the uppermost level. These spaces are used by both cadets and visitors with which, which with the, uh, the beautiful peaks of the chapel rising towards the sky attracts more than 1 million a year. Designed by SOM, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill as part of the master plan and design of the entire US Air Force Academy campus, the cadet chapel was created as a single symbolic religious structure that accommodates the individuality of three major American faiths, thus requiring three distinct chapels. So this is very interesting. In one building, there are three religious denominations together. In creating a monumental religious building, the design incorporated a monumental structure system. 17 rows of spires rise 150 feet, so that's 50 meters high, coming to 17 points, shooting towards the sky above, using repetition to enhance the powerful essence of each massive spire. These spires are used with a tubular steel frame of 100 identical tetrahedrons that make up the structure. The south facade is the entrance of the chapel. This is rather unusual. Usually, you know, you enter at west, 
which begins with a granite stairway climbing to a one-story landing that leads to a band of gold anodized aluminum doors. Although a single building, the chapel houses three distinct main worship areas on two main levels, a Protestant chapel, a Catholic chapel, and a Jewish chapel, along with two all-face rooms and two meeting rooms. The Protestant chapel is located on the upper level, and the Jewish and Catholic chapels and one all-face room are located beneath it. Another level below lies the larger all-face room and the, and the meeting rooms. The Protestant chapel is the largest chapel and is designed to seat 1,200 people. The nave is 90 feet tall, so almost 30 meters tall at its highest peak and measures 64 by 168 feet. The tetrahedrons form the walls of the chapel with stained glass windows in between them that progress from darker to lighter as they approach the altar, creating a beautifully lit majestic space. Here it is. Uh, some say that it was, um, it is, a, it is, it was, it, it will be a building that unites the medieval with the modern. There is also a reference to the, the airplane itself, because this was built for the cadets, you know, the, the officer was uh, training to become pilots of this, uh, you know, for the U.S. Army, the Air Force Army. But this is a religious building. I wonder what the Orthodox uh, fathers of the church in our country would think seeing it. It's huge, as you can see. But I am sure it is inspiring, and not just for the tourists, the one million uh, tourists who visit it, but mainly actually for the people living and working there and studying there. This is to me surprising and uh, maybe a subject of, uh, of a possible discussion. How come that the army, you know, is so innovative in its vision in terms of, uh, you know, in its architecture? Because that's not what you usual, we, we usually think about the army as being sophisticated and promoting the new and even the avant-garde. It is a remarkable building, and it was designed by SOM, but uh, the main author is uh, Walter Netsch, who died on the 15th of June. Uh, you see it here. Of course, there are many buildings. This is uh, an important institution, so to speak. Walter Netsch, SOM, Skidmore, Owings, and Mary. Stained glass windows. Yes, all for it. And I would say we could use it even uh, in uh, domestic uh, programs or institutional programs. Please indulge yourselves. Instead of, uh, who knows, watching TV, make a nice design for a stained glass window and incorporate it in your project, whatever the function, uh, an architecture center or a, a house or an apartment building, uh, make a stained glass window. It's a nice exercise and it would be even nicer if it gets built. Uh, there are so many artists who have nothing to do, you know, who are forgotten by society. Associate yourselves with a, an artist and uh, create a stained glass window for a building. Now, you realize very well the scale of this uh, chapel. It's almost a cathedral. Maybe even without almost. And you know, you look at the organ, Oh, and there you see the the organ the, the musical instrument uh, is not uh, 
maybe uh, you know uh, um, extravagantly modern. I think in in such a context with such an architectonic envelope, modern as it is, even a you know a historicist uh, altar would look great. As you have here, you know this uh, this well these sculptures, they are figurative, but I think even better would have looked some old ones. There is another great building here built, and I'm afraid I don't have it in this uh, presentation that was built after Walter Netsch died, um, a center for, uh, I don't know exactly how to uh, describe it, and I don't know its name uh, correctly. It's like a center for uh, a personal development, very, very uh, uh, um, expressive uh, structurally and you can find it on um, on google images searching for uh, us uh, uh, for air force academy and you'll see uh, an incredible diagonal and that's the building the diagonals are present here too the power of the triangle and then the, you know the the diagonals that form the two uh, sides of the triangle uh, besides the base. It's a very elegant but a very um, eloquent structure. Courageous as it is, yes. Architecture is good when it is courageous and when it is uh, uh, afraid and timid and tamed, it's not so good. The Circle Campus of the University of Illinois. Uh, we saw earlier a color picture of this building. I don't know if he built the tower too, but he built this uh, lower, uh, lower building covered with bricks. Not bad, Walter Netsch. And the students. enjoying themselves on these steps, which uh, can be used for, uh, uh, you know, going to a higher level uh, and to sit down and talk and so on. A lot of concrete, unfortunately. Yes, at that time, the concrete was not uh, considered uh, malevolence in terms of pollution, but it is. So today we have to be more um, careful about using concrete. I look at those cars there, my God, my God. I read somewhere that 10% uh, of the, the entire surface of the United States is covered by parking lots and uh, highways. 10%, it's incredible. I wonder, is the car in the service of man or man is in the service of the car? It's very interesting, you know, you look at the plan, we saw this plan before, and it's the ornamentalization of functions in a way. It's clearly an effort towards some kind of an idealization, or, you know, this interplay with the, between octagons it's even something Islamic here, you know, and uh, he probably might have protested, you know, but uh, um, anyway, I think what's beautiful about architecture is the obsession of the architects. If you have an obsession, like in other words, well, there is a difference between obsession and love, they say, but a strong love does remind one of obsession. It becomes an obsession. And I think if you have obsessions in architecture, it's a good thing. It might be bringing you to 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 the you know on the edge of of the abyss and to some form of craziness. But but what would we do without this craziness? Really, life would be an immense bore. Be crazy, dear architects. Please, please be crazy. Be obsessed. Obsessed. Have 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 great passion. If you have great passion, you have you do you know 
uh, crazy things, but some beautiful things could come into being. You know, Walter Netsch had his obsessions, but exactly these obsessions, I think, make us talk about him today. So that was about Walter Netsch. He deserves more. It's an introduction to him. And I promise the next time I'll talk about him, I will, um, I will learn more myself about him. Let's, let's, uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about him, if you don't mind. 